This is CNN. stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. Well, the last major terror attack on American soil before the Boston bombings happened on President George W. Bush's watch. That was almost 12 years ago, of course. Who can forget that image of the president there at Ground Zero? Tomorrow, the George W. Bush Presidential Library Museum is going to be formally dedicated in Dallas, Texas. All, former, all four uh, living former presidents will attend. So will President Obama. The library opens to the public. Coming up uh, next month, Laura Bush had a big hand in its design. We should point out it has been more than four years since the, the former first couple left the White House. They're now grandparents. Chief National Correspondent John King talked with them recently inside the new library. Mr. President, Mrs. Bush, thank you for your time. Let me start by saying congratulations. Uh, this is a beautiful place. Uh, and congratulations also on being your grandparents. Thank you well, very she's, much. She's a beautiful child. Uh, <laughs> inter interesting time in the life, right? It really is. Um, I want to spend most of our time on the lessons we will learn uh, when we visit this place over the years and why you did what you did here. But I, ju I just want to ask you, sir, the investigation is ongoing. I don't want to get into the details, but just as the man who was commander-in-chief on 9-11, what went through your mind when you heard explosions at the finish line of the Boston Marathon? Yeah. Um, uh, I was reminded that evil exists uh, and that there are people in the world who are willing to kill innocent people to advance uh, a cause. I don't know what this cause is, but we'll find out. Um, at the, during the same week, uh, uh, in a town close to us at Crawford, a plan exploded. And both incidents remind me of uh, how fragile life can be for some. And both incidents, uh, you know, made us weep, knowing that somebody was uh, hurting a lot. Let's focus on this place, and it's beautiful, and it's brand new. You're the librarian in the family. <laughs> Are you the decider when it comes to this building? Well, I was the chairman of the design committee. Yes, sure. is the answer. <laughs> but it was really fun for me to work on it, since I am a librarian, and also I'm particularly interested in architecture. So we're very proud of the way it looks. It looks terrific. Elleg it's an elegant building. Just like the chairman of the, <laughs> of the design committee. <laughs> You're going to have all of the living presidents you here bet. Uh, for the dedication. Uh, what have you learned from the formers, uh, your dad, uh, President Clinton, President Carter, about how to be most effective in a post-presidency? Well, uh, you learn that uh, life doesn't end after you're president. In other words, you, you're going 100 miles an hour, and, and uh, in my case, we woke up in Crawford and I was going zero. <laughs> and so the challenge is how to live life to its fullest. In my case, I've chosen to do so outside the, outside the limelight. Uh, on the other hand, I am confident that when it's, uh, this chapter of our life is finished, uh, we will both be able to say that we've advanced uh, the cause of peace and freedom and, and, the human, and imp helped improve the human condition. One of the things I think that is uh, fascinating about the library is that you've created this uh, exhibit called the Decision Points Theater. Yeah where any visitor can walk in and see some of the advice you got on the hard ones. You bet. And then make their own decisions yeah. based on what you saw at the time. Uh, I want to go to one of those, which is the Iraq decision, which you know is something people always debate when they talk about that word you don't like, legacy. <laughs> uh, people in that room will see what you saw at the time. Right. I, I want to ask you, sir, based on what you know now, uh, do, do you wish that instead of the Rumsfeld Doctrine, which was lean and mean, you know, going with a lighter force, uh, that you had maybe adopted what your dad did in the first Gulf War, the Powell Doctrine, and gone in with overwhelming force? Oh, I, in my book, I pointed out that I, there are some, uh, you know, tactics that uh, need to be revisited. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the removal of Saddam Hussein uh, was the right decision. America's more secure. Um, the Iraqi people have a chance to live in a free society. Uh, the museum uh, is a, it does give people the opportunity to hear uh, the different points of view that I got on these particular issues, the purpose of which is not to try to defend a policy, the purpose of which is to try to show people what it's like to be the president and how you make decisions. Um, history will ultimately judge uh, the decisions that were made uh, for Iraq and uh, I'm just not going to be around to see the final verdict. Um, 
He's not going to be around. It's an interesting way to put it. You, um, <laughs> in other words, I'd be dead. <laughs> uh, as, as First Lady, and now as part of the Institute here, uh, you focus on the empowerment of women. We saw it a lot in Afghanistan uh, in the initial months after 9 11. Uh, what's your sense now when you look at what you can do and what the Institute can do? If you look at that region, whether it's Iraq we just talked about, still a big question mark. Uh, if you look around, look at Syria, look at Egypt. The, the whole region is in this incredibly volatile stage. And, uh, have the rights of women in some ways uh, been set back because of all the changes or at least held hostage to all the volatility? Not necessarily, no. I think there, I think people really worldwide are looking at the rights of women and seeing how important women are to every society. When you look at countries where women's rights are marginalized and where half the population is looked out, left out, uh, you usually see a failing country. That's what we saw in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm still worried about the women in Afghanistan as we draw down our numbers of troops. What um, can you do about I mean, is but, it? Is there so much the uncertainty? Other hand, it's women hard to get have involved. made great strides in Afghanistan. Democracies take time to evolve. And Laura and I believe that women will help lead the democracy movements in these young democracies. And part of our afterlife uh, will be to uh, in, in enable and empower women and to remind our country through programs that we institute here that our involvement overseas is necessary to our national security. I want to ask you, what will we learn uh, from the theater and from all the memos that eventually will be made public about one of the toughest decisions of your presidency, which was right before Katrina, uh, where you had to decide whether or not to send in the federal troops, and you had a big debate about whether to overrule the governor. That's right. Yeah, I think you'll just learn that, that uh, about the dilemma of uh, federal law related to natural disasters. I mean, natural disasters in our country have generally been left uh, to the governors. And the role of the federal government is to be supportive. In this case, the natural disaster was so overwhelming and the infrastructure was so overwhelmed that I had a tough choice to make. And um, people will just learn the facts. See, that's all I care about. And that's why I wrote my book, which I'm sure you've assiduously studied. <laughs> and. Uh, well, thank you. And you talk about you talk about the idea that you have a southern governor, a woman governor, in a state with a large African American population, a former governor yourself. Yeah. And people were telling you, Mr. President, maybe you need to declare an insurrection. Insurrection, which would have been pretty difficult. Not pretty difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. And so it, it just points out the dilemma. You wish, in hindsight, you had done it. No, not really. I'm, uh, you know, I get, there's no telling how history would have recorded the, the situation had I declared an insurrection. I can tell you that the decibel level would have risen even louder than it was. It, the point is, is that it, it, this helps uh, Americans understand, one, uh, what the, the decisions that I made during a massive storm, but also points out the, the dilemmas that presidents face, not just me, but every president has got a series of conflicting uh, advisors, and you just got to pick and make the best judgment call you can. And uh, hopefully people will go to the Decision Points Theater and say, wow, I didn't understand that, or I now understand it better. And it's interesting to me, they say, uh, of how a president makes decisions, and hopefully it'll help them make better decisions. Well, John King joins me now uh, from Dallas. John, it's interesting to see the former president and, and his wife. You've walked through the library. Um, what's it like? What did you find most interesting? Well, Anderson, we'll hear more from the president in a moment. When you walk through the library, and people should come here and visit, whether you agree with George W. Bush, whether you supported him or not, what is most jarring is that you see from the very beginning the presidency he planned and then the presidency he had. By that, I mean you start out in a room where there are school books, children's books. The president wanted to focus on education reform in his first term. Then you see the state dinner on September 6, 2001. President Vicente Fox of Mexico at the time. Remember, candidate Bush, he promised that humble foreign policy. He promised it would be focused on the hemisphere, Mexico, Latin and Central and South America, and then you step across the threshold in Anderson, you literally are on September 11th. You see pictures of the towers, you see that bullhorn the president had on September 14th at Ground Zero, and you see a twisted piece of steel, part of the steel girding of the second tower is right in the middle of that room, and you are reminded of how in a flash on that crisp September morning this presidency changed, and as you take a few more steps, you also then see pictures of Saddam Hussein and the statue coming down in Baghdad. So you see how the president rallied the country after 9-11, and then you step into what became, next to Katrina, uh, the biggest controversy with Katrina, the biggest controversy of his administration, the decision then to go from all that 9-11 popularity into what became such an unpopular war in Iraq, Anderson. Fascinating to hear he was being advised to, to declare an insurrection. Uh, John, stay with us. You talked a lot more uh, about a lot of different subjects, including the, the alleged tensions among his White House team and why President Bush says he's a contented man today. Part two of John's interview is next. 
Well, as I mentioned, tomorrow, President Obama and all four living former presidents are going to be in Dallas for the dedication of the George W. Bush Presidential Library and, and Museum. Former President Bush's White House team will be there as well. Some of his former advisors and staffers have talked pretty candidly about the bumps in his presidency and tensions in the Bush White House. That's where part two of John King's interview with George and uh, Laura Bush picks up. Your, your friend and longtime advisor Karen Hughes uh, told me recently the combination of the rising opposition to the Iraq war and then Katrina came right at that moment. Uh, she said it uh, cast what she called a, quote, huge shadow over the rest of the presidency. Is that a fair assessment? You know, the historians will judge that, John. Uh -huh. Was it harder, though, to get things done? Well, I tried to get immigration reform done, and it didn't happen, and Social Security reform. Uh, and those two issues didn't take place. I don't think it was because of any shadows. I think it was because, one, Congress is reluctant to take on, uh, it was reluctant to take on a difficult issue like Social Security. In other words, the legislative body tends to be reactive, and, um, and until a crisis is imminent, it's hard to get them to move forward. Uh, and, uh, and on immigration reform, a, a populist streak hit. Uh, during the midst of the debate and made it difficult to do. But, you know, the job of the president is to look beyond the moment and anticipate problems and encourage a legislative body to move. Um, uh, I, eventually, these problems will get solved. And elements of your party abandoned you on immigration. And Social Security. Uh, do you feel a sense of redemption now when you see leaders in the party you saying know, we have to do something that looks a whole lot like Bush McCain <laughs> no, Kennedy? I don't, I don't really view it as uh, redemption. I view it as smart. And logical, and I was real proud of my little brother being out there, you know, uh, pushing the issue because he understands the issue well. Um, eventually, these problems will get solved, and a president just has to understand that not every issue uh, gets solved during his presidency, but he can contribute uh, to the ultimate solution. And, I want to ask each of you, looking back now that you're removed from the daily politics, and you, especially at the end of the presidency, was a pretty polarizing time. Um, how much do you think that the, the, you know, the angst about Katrina, uh, the opposition to the Iraq war, just hardened some people so that they just couldn't see other things? Uh, I'll mention PEPFAR, for example, yeah. remarkable work against malaria and AIDS in Africa. Uh, the Medicare prescription drug benefit, uh, which under budget, according to most costs, and yet many of your fellow Republicans say, you know, why did George W. Bush give us this liberal entitlement? <laughs> <laughs> you know, John, I, um, I'm... Uh, really not that concerned about uh, why people did what during my presidency. I'm more concerned about um, being an effective person for the rest of my life. I know this, that uh, Laura and I gave uh, the presidency eight years of our life. We gave it our all, I made the best judgment calls I could. I didn't compromise my principles. And I'm a content man. And uh, I am excited about uh, what we're going to do here? You, you've made two trips, two trips to Africa since leaving office, and I understand there's a third one coming up. This yes, sir. Time. What draws you there? Um, the human condition. I, uh, I think it's important to set priorities in life. I always said that uh, one of the principles that was important to me was human life. We went to Africa and saw. Uh, People dying, needlessly dying, and there's nothing more important, I think, and Laura thinks as well, to help somebody live. And so, um, uh, during my presidency, I convinced Congress to spend taxpayers' money to save lives, not only uh, from HIV, but as well from malaria, and it worked. And we wanted to continue that type of work with cervical cancer. Um, this will bring your team together. Yes, it uh, will. For the dedication. And we've talked to a lot of them uh, in recent days. Uh, at the end of the presidency, there was some strain with your vice president uh, over some policy disagreements in the second term over the Scooter Levy yeah. pardon decision. Uh, is hit that relationship still strained? Has it been? No, it was never strained. That's, uh, I think that's uh, the mythology that's, uh, uh, that, that we've escaped. In other words, there's a mythology in Washington. There's a kind of a... Well, he writes in his book that things were tense. Not really. The oh, they were on Scooter Libby. Yeah, he didn't agree with that decision. But I don't, you know, uh, I, I, people ought to look at uh, the, the total picture. And we're friends then and friends now. Can you enlighten us uh, to the painting? <laughs> <laughs> George, w. George W. Rembrandt. <laughs> 
George was looking for a pastime, actually, when he gave up smoking cigars. So it, he um, read Churchill's book, Painting is a Pastime. And, yeah. And he's actually very good. He's a very good painter. What do you get from it? A lot of things, John. I get, I relax. Uh, I um, see colors differently. Uh, I am, I guess, tapping a part of the brain that, you know, certainly never used when I was a teenager. <laughs> and uh, I get the satisfaction out of uh, completing a project. And uh, I paint people's pets, <laughs> and I, I'd love to give them uh, their pet as a gift. Now, I readily concede the signature is more valuable than the painting. <laughs> He's become a pet portrait painter. <laughs> it's hard to say if you say it quickly. Um, this is my second dedication of a Bush presidential library. There you go. Um, I was at your father's. Uh, I'm happy to be at this one. Uh, will I ever go to a third? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think because of his example, uh, his grandchildren and children uh, admire uh, his service and realize you can go into the public arena and not lose your soul. Uh, and that you can be a good father and still be a political figure. He's, he's been an inspiration for me, obviously, but uh, as well, brother, sister, and grandchildren. And there's no telling. There is a nephew, uh, George P. Bush, who is uh, uh, on the hustings here in Texas. And uh, You're not skipping Jeb, are you? Well, Big Jeb, you know, he's, he's, uh, he, he's got a decision to make. And uh, I, if I could make it for him, it'd be run, but I can't. And I don't know what he's going to do. He'd be a great candidate and a great president. But I do know his, net, his son, George P., has made up his mind. And he's, he's uh, running for general land commission in Texas, an important position. And I think will do very well if given the chance to serve. Do you prefer the post-presidency to the presidency? No, I loved it, too. I mean, I've loved every part of our life from when we were in Midland, Texas, to... Uh, to those eight years at the White House. It was a huge privilege uh, to live at the White House and serve the American people. And here, back home in Dallas. Thank you both so much for your time and congratulations and good luck with this place. Yeah, thanks, Thank John. You. Thank you. John, it really is fascinating to, to kind of hear them in, in, in depth like that. He, President Bush sa says he's content. Do you think he's really as, as unconcerned as he seems about his legacy, about what people think of him? Uh, yes and no, in the sense that it is who he is. Remember, all during his presidency, he was like this. He's not at least publicly introspective. But, Anderson, here's what I take away from this. If you go inside this campus, this library, and it's very impressive, again, whether you like or dislike George W. Bush, it's an impressive place. There is a sculpture in the center court of President 41, George Herbert Walker Bush, and President 43, George W. Bush. This is a very competitive family. George W. Bush, remember, was around two Reagan terms, his father's one term. He was so stung when his father lost. He's a very competitive person and a very loyal Republican. You heard him nudging his brother Jeb there to run in 2016. So you have a proud Republican, a proud family that is treated like pariahs by the Republican Party right now. Publicly, he says, eh, it's like water on a duck. Privately, when you talk to his friends, of course it bothers him, which is why he's grateful it's turned back his way on immigration. And we'll watch tomorrow. It'll be interesting to hear his dad speak. But also, three Democrats tomorrow are going to have to say good things. Carter, Clinton, and Bush. Uh, Carter, Clinton, and Obama. Three Democrats will have to say good things about George W. Bush, Anderson. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I'll be anchoring our coverage uh, starting at 11 o'clock tomorrow of the dedication. I hope you join us for, for that. Uh, John King uh, will be uh, integral uh, in that as well. John, thanks very much for that in-depth uh, interview tonight. That does it for us. We'll be back also in Boston, of course, at 8 o'clock tomorrow night, 10 o'clock uh, uh, Eastern time uh, tomorrow night, but back in Boston. Aaron Burnett out front starts right after the break. from now, there will be quite a sight on the campus of Southern Methodist University. Five U.S. presidents, Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and George Bush Jr. and Sr. will all be on hand for the dedication of the new George W. Bush Presidential Library. CNN's John King live from Dallas this morning. And John, I understand you got a personal tour from a very special tour guide. 
I sure did, Christine, and good morning to you. It's a very impressive library here, whether you agreed or disagreed with the presidency of George W. Bush. It's interesting, Christine. I sat down with both Bushes, George W. and Laura Bush. He said he knows opening this museum will restore the Iraq debate, restore the Katrina debate. He says, I am a content man, those are his words, and that history will ultimately make the judgments about his legacy. After that joint interview, Laura Bush, the former first lady, did take me on a personal tour of the library. What is striking when you walk through this library is you begin with the presidency George W. Bush thought he would have, and then how all of it changed on that crisp September morning. It's the turning point. This part of the library, the very beginning part, are the issues that we thought we'd be spending all of our time on. This is the state dinner with Mexico. We thought, of course, that our, relations, our international relationships with Central and South America would be the ones we would focus on the most. And then, of course, we turn the corner here, and it's September 11th. So this big piece, this big, is from the uh, second tower. It's the 83rd floor, the point of impact. And you can see it's really like a sculpture, but uh, it's the, one of the beams from the World Trade Center. You were with Senator Kennedy that day? That's right. I was with him, mm -hmm. and I have actually over here on the wall the painting he gave me that day, um, signed and dated September 11th. This display goes through minute by minute uh, from the first tower to Shanksville and then day by day on this screen to up until the joint session when George spoke to the joint session of Congress. Uh, there's a little booth over here for people to record their memories of where they were on September 11th so all of those memories can become a part of the archive here. That's great. Uh, and this, this is and pretty, that's the pretty famous. That's right. And some people think that in some ways that was uh, with the country at its lowest point, your husband hit his highest point. That's right. Well, I you think it that? gave, um, I think that was just another example of um, how his leadership really helped us through those years and through that time. Uh, people really pulled together. I remember those days driving into New York after um, September 11th and the flags were everywhere and they still are. Uh, when I drive in still now to see my grandbaby, I hope, um, I still see those flags everywhere. This is a replica of the Oval Office as it was when George officed here. What is the, the president like when he comes in here? I think he, he really he, likes it a lot. Does he want to start barking out orders? Well, no, he, he still does that at home, but not really. <laughs> Looks great, doesn't it? So it's a reproduction of the rug that we designed, and then if you look up, you'll see the seal on the ceiling, just like in the real Oval Office. And um, it's been fun to work on this. And I think, and people, this, for many, many people, this will be their only chance to ever step into any space that is like the Oval Office. So it's fun to have it as part of the tour. He uh, often talked, uh, the president did, about living in the people's house and, and then how extra special this space mm -hmm. was. And he was um, very respectful of it, as you know. He, mm -hmm. he wore a suit uh, when he came into the Oval Office. Um, he also, he does the tour in here. It's his voice that you'll hear. And there are a lot of things about the Oval Office that he thinks represent uh, what was important to him. Obviously, there are paintings of Texas on the wall, the Rio Grande in that painting. and. Uh, the Alamo and uh, the prickly pear cactus from Texas. But also he put two presidents, Washington over the, the mantle, and then President Lincoln, the, the president that you're most aware of when you live in the White House. But he said he could put the most influential presidents on the wall because the most influ influential president for him's portrait hung in his heart. Oh. And that's his dad. So we're so glad his dad's going to be here for the library opening. That's great. And Christine, having covered the first six years of the Bush presidency, I can tell you when they say exact replica of the Oval Office, they got it just right. I was half expecting the staff to beam in and yell at me, don't ask any questions in the Oval Office. And a few other key points is a decision points theater where you can walk in as a visitor into this theater and get the advice President Bush received about Iraq, get the advice he received about Katrina, and make your own decisions about whether you would agree or disagree with what the president did. And one thing that will be somewhat controversial, when you're in that war of terror room, the timeline from 9-11, you go seamlessly from that 
that bullhorn just steps away to pictures of Saddam Hussein, obviously the Iraq War. So the president knows as he opens this library today, uh, he is trying to make his statement about how he hopes history will judge his legacy. But, Christine, they're also likely to stir up some of the old controversies as well. We'll discuss that and more with one of his top advisors, the former White House counselor, Ed Gillespie, who will join us here at this dedication ceremony in just a few moments, Christine. And it will be something, John King, to see all of those presidents together, a real moment of history, no right. question. All right, we'll be watching all morning. Thanks, John.